Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the 40 Oti podcast. How are you guys doing? It's uh, It's been a stressful day at work for me. I had a lot on, so it's nice to come come here and, and chat to you guys as well. Today, we are talking about social aspies and extroverted activities. It sounds like I've sort of made that up to be some kind of rhyming thing, but really it's not. It just happens to be like that. Not that you care, but it's okay. Right. Um, <laughs> so today I've got a very special guest, as always, and it is Lauren from the Aspionel Instagram page. Say hi, Lauren. Hi. Thanks for having me. No worries. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. It's been a low key day. I'm I'm excited to be here. Excited to talk about some some autism. Do a bit of monologuing. Back and forth monologuing. Uh, always, always love talking about autism. <laughs> well, we have that in common. And um, so do you want to like introduce everybody a little bit into who you are and what you do on like Instagram, what you do for work, your kind of diagnosis and stuff? Yeah, of course. So, yeah. So I'm Lauren Melissa. I also go by Aspionel. And in real life, outside of the internet, social media world, I am a librarian. I am based out of New York City. And I was diagnosed with autism five years ago when I was 23 years old. So I was a late diagnosis. And since then, I've just kind of really explored autism spectrum disorder, Asperger's syndrome, learned more about myself. And I've just really been excited to share with people my experiences and where I've come from and where I'm going. So it's great to be connected to the autism community now. And where whereabouts are you are you based like in the world? I'm based in New York City in the United States, obviously. And I <laughs> <laughs> I'm not from here though originally. I'm from California, the other side of the country. Ah, Cali. Mm-hmm. Very nice. So it is the much slight contrast between New York and California. Definitely a contrast, especially in weather, because I'm from Southern California. But I enjoy both places. They have a lot to offer. And it's nice to be in New York City versus San Diego. Both are great. There's a lot of different kinds of people, a lot of diversity, and a lot to get involved in. So I enjoy it here. Cool. And are you happy to be in, in the big city? Because I know that I I personally, I like my little small towns. That's my my safe space. Um, I, f- I lived in Manchester for about three years and I got by, but it was a little bit too busy and noisy and too many people. Do you find that living in a city is all right for you? So when I first told people that I was moving to New York City, they were astonished. They they said, how, how are you going to make it there with all the sensory stimulation? Fortunately, I actually live in a more residential area in New York City. So my neighborhood where I live is pretty quiet. And I also work outside of the city in a quieter area. So whenever I go into that big heart of Manhattan or those big, high, crowded areas, it's always an intentional choice. Mm-hmm. So you're sort of ready to ready to face it. Exactly. That's good. I I like that kind of thing. I mean, uh, the the place that I live. So I live in like North Yorkshire, in the UK, and North Yorkshire is pretty quiet. It's more of like, um, it's not. It's like the opposite side of the country to London. So it's it's good. Like the town's quite. It's not busy, but it's busy enough for it to be something that I think about when I go out. But I live, 
you know, like 20, 25 minutes from the town center and where I live, it's, it's quiet. You know, I, li- I live opposite a field and it's, it's quite nice. And if I want to go do, do stuff that's a bit more, you know, outgoing and, and all that, then I can sort of walk into the center in about 20 minutes, which is nice. Uh, so yeah, you said that you were diagnosed when you were 23. How was that? How was that experience for you? Oh, well, being diagnosed was honestly the best thing that ever happened to me because it's not like I wasn't autistic before I was diagnosed. I just didn't know what was going on. Um, Prior to that, I'd been diagnosed with a multiplicity of things, migraines, fibromyalgia, just I could go on and on and on. Um, I really struggled with social interactions and with keeping friends, and I just had no idea why I would get super angry at times, which we now know is melting down or why I would burn out. And so finally, I had this very eye-opening workplace conflict with a colleague where I thought that I had been being very supportive and helpful to her. And she completely thought I was a snob, stuck up, trying to control her, like every negative adjective you could pull out. And Mm -hmm. I... I had had that experience before and I was kind of getting tired of it because I was like, how can I not be nice to people? Like, I don't understand how can I build friendships and relationships if when I'm trying my hardest, everybody thinks that I am hurting them. And so I had looked up Asperger's syndrome before because I had always been looking up multiple diagnoses in high school, trying to figure out what was going on when I was struggling back then as well. Mm -hmm. Every time I took a screener, I would come up as not autistic, non-Asperger's. But then after that workplace conflict, I I just got this idea. What if I look up Asperger's syndrome in women? And I came across Rudy Simone's traits and symptoms of Asperger's in females and women. And it was like I read a description of myself. And from mm-hmm. that moment forward, I started doing more research, reading all the books I could find about Aspian women. And then I sought a formal diagnosis. About three-fourths of the way through that, the psychiatrist was like, we're going to keep doing the evaluation, but I just want you to know that you are on the spectrum. <laughs> and so it was a it was a great thing. I, I cried. She cried for me. <laughs> it was it was a, such a relief. And to know that there was an answer and mm -hmm, definitely yeah it was great it must have been quite sort of taxing on you both like monetary wise and and energy and motivation wise to have to go like going to screenings and being sort of turned away when, when you know that there is something there that they're not seeing i i think it's a lot easier for um uh, a lot easier for girls to sort of slip under the radar when it comes to assessments and, and stuff like that, especially like in adulthood. You know, like you, you, you tend to have a lot more of like those, um, so it sounds bad when I'm saying it, but like su- superficial non-autistic traits, if that makes sense. So like you're very good at like social mimicry and copying facial expressions and stuff. Whereas I feel like, for the most of the autistic guys that I've met, that's it doesn't really happen. Yes, yes. The masking of our traits and things like that, it's pretty common. And I think a big part of it has to do with the fact that just in childhood in general, girls are given more directives than boys and told how to behave. I think there's like studies on just how many more directives girls receive than boys. And so we learn very early on to act a certain way, be a certain way, pretend to be something, but it's really Mm -hmm. psychologically damaging for autistic girls and all girls, to be honest, but autistic girls very much so, because we just completely deny who we are. I bet. It must, it must be quite, it must be quite a relief because I I remember when I got uh, diagnosed and I was 10 years old and I found that relief, but 23, that's, I can't, I can't even comprehend how that would feel because it's, you know, obviously, like I'm 22. It's like next year I would be diagnosed, and that's when I would know. That just seems absolutely crazy to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, never too late, right? 
<laughs> Definitely. And I know a lot of, you know, people, public figures in the news and stuff have, have um, got late diagnoses and stuff. There's this lady called uh, Louise Crooms that I did a little BBC video with and she she got diagnosed, I think, in her late 30s, which is mad. It's crazy. It's insane. Like, I can't even comprehend what that would be like, but it it is, I suppose, the main thing is, is that you know now. And once once you know, you sort of, you, you can look at your past and stuff and you can sort of pick stuff out and analyze it and get over things that troubled you when you were younger. Would you say that that's something that you did? Most definitely. After my diagnosis, it, it made so much of my childhood and adolescence make sense in ways that had never made sense before. Um, just from small things to me, lining up and creating these really strange, like organized Barbie doll worlds, but never playing with them um, to, <laughs> <laughs> to um, you know, going to school one day and finding out that all of my friends no longer liked me and I had no idea why. Oh, um, yeah. So, I empathize with that a lot. <laughs> yeah. It's tough. I, I think middle school years and high school years were some of the toughest of my life. College too, but middle school, when everybody is already awkward and trying to figure out how to be a teen, I just, I don't, I wasn't ready for it. And I made so many quote unquote social mistakes, which was which were just me being myself. But my peers, they caught on to that very quickly and I was rejected pretty fast, I would say. But on the flip side, at least I did well in school. So I had some positive memories. <laughs> We've always got those um high, high grade figures, you know, that uh eight point <laughs> increase in the IQ and all that above average intelligence. Not saying that that's taken away from your achievements. <laughs> Not saying that. <that's>, no. <laughs> okay. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about your work on Instagram because I want to know why you've chosen to to do this kind of thing. Because I know a lot of people who I've I've talked to and some of my friends that watch my YouTube videos and stuff they. They're quite astonished that someone would want people to know about their life like that. So I just want to know what, you know, what drives you to do it and what you hope to do with it in the future. That kind of begins with my diagnosis. When I was diagnosed, I was told that my symptoms were pretty severe. My traits were very intense in a lot of areas. And the psychiatrist was really shocked because she wanted to kind of know how I had developed so many coping skills without support, given the mm -hmm. severity of a lot of my experiences. And that kind of stuck with me. And I thought a lot about how do I know to do this? Or how did I figure out to do that when I was upset or when I was in pain or, or when I was overstimulated? And I, I didn't know any autistic people in real life at the time. So I wanted to connect with autistic people, but I also wanted to talk to them and share with them just the things I did in daily life, just in case it could help someone. And so I actually opened up my Instagram just with that in mind. I was, I just thought, what if I could help someone? What if, what if they don't realize you could just do stand on one leg while brushing your teeth and that would make your hip strength stronger and alleviate Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Like what if they didn't know that? And if I told them that and it completely changed their lives, you know, random things like that. And so I started my Instagram and I started making Aspie tips, which I now call Audi tips, mm -hmm. which were just little ideas of things that I did throughout the day. And it really developed and grew um, I would get messages from people asking me for tips on certain things. And I realized, wow, I could, I could help support people based on their needs more than just what I am already doing because I am kind of a verbal processor and it's pretty easy for me to put into words, thoughts and ideas. So I don't think that it's necessarily that I'm saying things that other autistic people 
aren't doing already. I think it's that I just have this knack for writing it out. And so I really enjoy sharing these tips, some of them by request, some of them by things that I live through in my everyday. And I kind of feel like it's evolved into an advice column. My mission is really just to bring autistic people to support each other, giving autistic people advice for how to navigate everyday life. But that advice is from autistic people instead of having neurotypical people tell us how to exist. So that's kind of my mission at this point. So I'd be the um, understanding person that knows what it's like rather than sort of like a medical professional telling you about all the ways that you can cope with symptoms, quotation marks. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yeah, I get that. (laughs) So... Am I right in thinking that, so your drive was that you are helping people and that makes you happy? Yes, I'm, I'm a helper by nature, I think. So I, I, that was the drive. I just wanted to reach out to and help people. And your, your mission is by, by your standards, com- sort of, uh, not complete, but you've reached what you want to do with it. Or is there something beyond that that you'd want to do with this kind of stuff? Right now, I'm at a pretty comfortable rhythm and how the audio tips are crafted and given out. But I do want to grow things to a bigger level. I would really, really like to go to colleges someday and speak with college students and disability centers to give them motivation and to just be someone that they can see maybe a mirror through. I would love to speak with, uh, I want to continue to speak with other autistic people. I, I have a lot of people who ask me if I want to make my mission, my goal to teach neurotypical people about autism. And while I think that that's something that naturally happens through my platform, my goal is always to just continue to reach other autistic people. That is my main goal. And I think, I feel like, already from you know looking at the the posts that you make and that they're all very very much you know descriptive and detailed and it looks like you put a lot of time into it um a lot of effort into it and it's it's really it is really great to see that kind of thing and it's it's nice nice to hear that you are you know people are messaging you and you're applying and you're giving them personal advice cuz th- that is to a lot of people it may, it may seem, you know, you know, as for example, if I, when I get messages and, and people um, ask me things, it's like, they don't expect you to reply to them because you're like, oh, mm-hmm. you're just a, you know, like Instagram influencer. But yeah, it's, I, I can imagine some, sometimes I think about it and I think about, it, oh, imagine if I messaged someone who was doing something like this when I was younger and asked for tips or if I just got into the, the, autism I was going to say autism realm but that sounds a bit pretentious um (laughs) but uh yeah it must it must be really great for them and it's I'm really glad that you you are helping them in that way it's a really good good thing to do uh so let's um let's get into the the meat of it so we've we've actually talked a little bit quite a lot about like schools and past experiences already and um do you want to give give us some like ex- examples of like the main struggles that you had at school um in terms of like friendships, social skills, going out and doing social activities and all that? Definitely. So ironically, in school, I always thought that I was an extrovert mainly because my sister and brother are extreme introverts and very shy. And so because I like to help people, I would always pretend to be extroverted to try to get especially my sister into friend groups and invited to things. And that was a lot of masking. As a result, though, since I was trying to be extroverted when I really wasn't, I would often just make a fool of myself. I would say things just to get a rise out of people, kind of, you know, class clown a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. But I would also I say that. a lot of, in a, 
I would say a lot of inappropriate things. And I would upset people who were my friends so much that they would stop being my friends. And I didn't know how to fix it because I didn't know how to be myself. And I would also get so burnt out from pretending to be something I wasn't all day at school that I would come home and have a meltdown almost every single day um, and start crying and screaming. So there was a lot of emotion involved for me in high school, especially around that. By the time I reached college, undergrad, I had figured out that I was really an introvert and my family, while it took them ages to believe it, are finally real have finally realized that too. Um, and <laughs> so I stopped trying to push myself to be this class clown, this funny person. But I still wanted to, you know, have friends and belong to a social circle. And I continued though to make social mistakes, say the things that other people were thinking, but not saying. I just mm-hmm. didn't realize that they were thinking it and not saying it. I thought I was the only one who could see things. So I would be like, well, I have to say these things out loud and it would <laughs> hurt people. I'll give you one example yeah. that that might be uh, a little funny. So it was in okay, my first semester, <laughs> it was in my first semester of college, and we had taken a midterm exam and I had done very well on it. This isn't this isn't a story about me doing well in school, but it's involved. <laughs> I had done very well on the exam and I came back, like I think I got like a 97 or something like that. So I came back nice. to class the next day and my professor says, so we did we didn't do so well in the midterm, everyone. And you know, I'm sitting there like, oh, but I did well, you know, thinking to myself, look, how could other people not have done as well as me? Just complete and total stuck inside my my own self and my brain and kind of thinking everyone experienced what I experienced. And he said, so I was I was thinking about, you know, weighting the grade and giving everyone an additional 10 points to kind of, you know, even out the field. What do you all think of that? So I took his question literally, what do you think of that? And I thought, oh, well, I'll share what I think about that. So I raised my hand and I said, I think that it might be a little unfair for those of us who did well on the exam. Yeah, I would say just about everyone in that class decided that I would never be their friend after that because (laughs) I tried to ruin their grades getting weighted, but I just didn't realize, like I actually had no idea that anybody was mad at me after that. I didn't realize that I was completely clueless. So that's an example of- you were just speaking your mind. Like I th- it's it's a good point, and it sort of takes away from the effort that you put put into your work. But maybe I, maybe not talk about it in front of class. <laughs> and now I look back and I think I would honestly I want all of their grades to be weighted. Like I look back and I just was so inexperienced, and I have to usually experience something to have empathy towards it. And yeah, I feel that, like yeah. at least immediate empathy without me focusing and focusing and focusing. And now I look back and I see, of course, everybody's grazing to be weighted. I've been glad many times in my life when my grade has been weighted. I just couldn't see it. And it definitely impaired a lot of my socializing during that time. I bet. But th- thank you for sharing that. I, um, I definitely have a lot of experiences that are similar to that where I'm sort of you sort of get you sort of stay in your own head for most of the time, like especially at school because it's quite a stressful environment. So you you always sort of stay in your own line and you don't really think about much at at the time. And it it usually takes me about a day or two just to you know if I've done something wrong and I can see that I've done something wrong, I need to like go and like monologue on my own, do some writing, and. Um, think it over and then I can I I usually come back with a lot of empathy for it but it's I think there is like a delay you you kind of have to use your logical brain to figure it out and try and think of it from other people's it's like an active process you need it needs to have intention behind it for you to understand it I do agree with that I think many times I just have to sit and really put myself in their shoes. And then it's like you said, I have almost at that point, like too much empathy. Um, But in the moment, it can, it can just take me a second to grasp it. Yeah. 
Well, it's nice. I've never, I've never actually heard anybody, anybody on the spectrum uh, talk about this before, um, which is nice because I, I feel the same way as well. And it's sometimes it can be a bit hard. It's, it's hard, and it? you, you go away from it, and you're thinking, "What did I do wrong?" And mm. sure, from, from an objective standpoint, sure, but socializing and people is a lot to do with. Using using emotions as well as what's happened and logic, and sometimes it takes a bit of time to like integrate it together. Yeah, completely. In terms of like looking back, what sort of improvements? I know it might. I mean, obviously, like I'm I'm guessing that you made a lot of improvements, um, for, just from you know our conversation so far, and just from like looking at your social media and stuff. But what like specific things do you think really helped you develop your social skills better? I think one of the first things that I started to do that has really helped me is to stop mimicking people. I mm-hmm. used to say to myself, I can be anything anybody wants. And I thought that it was a positive trait, but it was really impairing my ability to make real connections with people, to make friends, because there's only so long that you can pretend to be something that you're not. And I thought it was honestly something that everybody did to make friends. But now I don't do that. I try to be my authentic self within reason. I mean, I'm not, there's certain Mm -hmm. things I'm just not going to do in certain circles, but that has more to do with navigating daily life and staying safe. But I think one of the first things that I started to do is to take off that mask, to always be my authentic self as much as possible. And then I end up making friends with people who like me for me. Yeah, and things that you have in common and people people that share like your values and stuff. Exactly. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I do sort of feel like I do generally have a certain mask when I meet new people. So I, I always, cause especially if people don't really understand autism or they have no experience talking or interacting with an autistic person, um, then I'm likely to, you know, sort of up my little neurotypical cues just to sort of ease them into it. Usually <laughs> that's usually what I do, but once they get <laughs> to know me, then they realize, oh yeah, this guy is, yeah, he's a bit, strange, <laughs> bit weird in a good way, of course wouldn't have it yes. any other way. And I feel like the older I get, you know, the more people are actually accepting of, oh, there's that quirky person. And they mm-hmm. kind of feel like this is the fun, quirky person that like totally makes things a little, this conversation different or this atmosphere more interesting because we're so used to the same thing day by day by day. So when you throw some quirkiness in there, everybody has a little bit of fun. Um, But to think back to your original question of changes that I've made and in order to experience, I guess, a better life for myself, I think the second thing that I changed that really made a huge difference was I started to become vastly more aware of my sensory state and when I'm overstimulated and when I'm not. So I would, I'm just more aware of walking into a space and and realizing that light is too garish and making a sound. I cannot sit here. I cannot work here. And just being aware of those things in my day to day, being aware of sounds that are hurting my head, being aware of when conversations are setting me off and being able to exit that situation as quickly as possible. It has done wonders for me in terms of being able to just get through a regular 24 hours and start the day and end the day on a good foot. It's it's nice to hear that you are making like improvements like that because I think that's one of the things that I, it's one of the last things that I sort of tried to fi- focus on and, and try and fix. I always, I always thought, yeah, I, I know I am a bit sensory overloaded and all that. And it does affect me, but I never quite realized to the extent that I, that it did affect me until I started trying things to try and help 
or giving myself some quiet time in in like social events and stuff you know because i sort of when i went when i'd go to like some social event like a party or i go out with some friends or something then i would always stick around to the end of it and then either the same night when i get home or the day after i would just i would be completely drained and very in a, in a very sort of sensitive emotional state and it is it is really hard to cope with and i i only you know really recently sort of realized that sensory aspects and being around people and all of that was quite important even just like going to the library and um a library at uni and and just sitting near a light that's a little bit too bright <laughs> yeah. I'm trying not to rhyme. I did, it just comes out my mouth. <laughs> but <laughs> sitting under a light that's a little bit too. <laughs> nice little l- l- lyric for anybody, any DJs out there want to make a little mix. Um, <laughs> what am I talking about? Okay, right. So the top the topic of this podcast is. As I've said, social stuff, extroverted things. What do we mean by extroverted activities? What do you what do you consider to be an extroverted activity? I consider any time when I'm not by myself or with my best friend to be an extroverted activity, to be honest. <laughs> so anytime I'm meeting up with a friend for coffee, perhaps I'm going to a concert. Perhaps I'm going to a convention, just getting dinner with friends, all of those things I consider to be extroverted activities. Anything that sort of drains your social battery to an extent. Yes. So anything that involves me giving of myself in order to enjoy time spent with others is an extroverted activity. That's a good definition. I like that. When when I think of extroverted activities, those those things sort of appear in my mind as well. But there's also things that are I things that I would consider to be extremely social extroverted behavior, like going to a concert or going to a nightclub or going traveling for like a weekend or something like that. Something that's either long term relatively long term or very intense those those type of things spring to my mind um as well but um do you have any any experience with those types of environments oh yes (laughs) i really i really enjoy a lot of extroverted activities because i I have special interests in things that involve music and um, fashion. And so in order really for fashion and music to be like fully experienced, it often includes extroversion. Dum, dum, dum. (laughs) I'm fortunate too with that. If it involves my special interest, when it's an extroverted activity, it's a little bit less draining than when it doesn't involve my special interest. So, for example, if I'm going to go out to dinner with friends, if I go to a restaurant that I know plays my favorite music, I'll enjoy myself a lot more than if I went to a restaurant that played music I didn't know. Mm -hmm. So there are just ways of kind of navigating extroversion by using my special interests to, to get me through it, to get me to have more fun and ease up. I really enjoy going to certain kinds of, like, I guess, anime, Japanese pop culture conventions is what people would call them. Well, like um, Comic-Con. Not the same thing, actually. So (laughs) Comic-Con is more in like the Marvel, Doctor Who, Uh, that side of the world. Japanese pop culture conventions have more to do with like anime, manga, Japanese video games, and music. And Mm -hmm. I'm obsessed with a lot of Japanese music. So I love to go to these conventions and they last for like four days. 
and just hang out in groups of large amounts of people and listen to music and dance. There's usually raves and just like have a great time. It's very, very extroverted. But because it involves my special interests, I can navigate it. That isn't to say that I'm not going to be completely burned mm -hmm. out afterwards. So just figuring out how to work through all that. I, su I suppose um, having something related to your special interests gives you a lot to talk about and a, a bit more of a bit more of like a, a template or a frame framework to work within. Because if you know that you go into somewhere where people like similar stuff to you, then it's a bit easier to know what to talk about and the sort of jargon to use and what kind of tone to strike. Because I, I very much, just going to say, I, I very much like like Japanese culture and stuff. I was I was massively into it when I was younger. I, I went I went for like a, a school trip to Japan one time. Cool. <laughs> and um, yeah, but we were outside quite a lot. I mean, we're doing a lot of stuff in the city. And because it was something that I was interested in, you know, looking at it now, you know, it was particularly stressful. And I think if I was to go to London, which has n nothing to do with anything that I like, then I don't think I'd be able to cope as well. But because it was Japan, it was cool Japan, you know, the quirky Japan. I was like, yes, I like it a lot. Yeah, it sort of helped a little bit, I suppose. But yeah, that's cool. Have you ever been to Japan? I've not. And it's it's kind of ridiculous because I've been in South Korea for like two or three months, but I never made it to Japan. Ooh. What was South Korea like? Oh, it was wonderful. Very dancey. Uh, there was definitely a lot of music playing from storefronts and the streets, but uh, it was great. And I had a nice time there. I feel like I could do an entire travel vlog about that. So let's just say, if you're interested in visiting South Korea, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds cool. I would like to see that. So if you ever, if you ever fancy making a, a uh, South Korean blog, I would definitely be up for watching those. So in, in terms of like extroverted things, uh, I personally like in, in terms of like going out and, and parties and things like that, I've always, I found that I always get on best. I always have a much more of a good time if I am either familiar with the place or the people. So I am very happy to go go out to this uh, club in Manchester called Satan's Hollow that play like heavy metal and alternative music. Nice. Because I know that it's music that I like and I can always go with my mate who likes that kind of music as well. And I also know that it's not incredibly busy because it's quite a relatively small place. And I yeah, I, f I find that you know, sort of even going to somewhere that even, even, even if somewhere else did play like heavy metal music and stuff, it, w it wouldn't be the same because I've been to this club so many times and I'm, I'm used to it and I know exactly what to expect. I know what smells like, I know what the, the lights are like, I know what the environment's like and it always makes it, it makes it more of a good night out for me. Um, as opposed to going to some, you know, bog standard like house club night or something, which um, I find not particularly enjoyable. <laughs> yes, and, I. Sorry, go on. Oh no, no. <laughs> I, I mean, I was just gonna say I completely relate. <laughs> Do you have you um, experienced a lot of nightlife in your uni? Uni days. I, I'm just saying I didn't go out that much. Like I'm not saying that I was a massive sesh head or anything I was I probably went out about five or six times in my second year which is not a lot yeah have you have you had any experience with that yes yeah, so actually during my undergrad I did go out a lot but what was odd was my school had a party schedule which is very strange. But on Wednesday, there was pub weird. and on, on Thursdays, there was this party. And on Fridays, there was like, it was very scheduled out. It was mapped out and they had like themed parties that you would be expecting every month. And so you could really prepare. You knew the location of it. Um, you could really prepare for it. So I think that actually I love contributed. I things. 
<laughs> oh, they had I some love great them ones. So much. Halloween events. Oh yes, there was a trick or drink. I remember that one. But uh, <laughs> so I did enjoy that a lot in college, um, and I agree that today, even now, I like to go out. I, you know, I like to go get a drink with friends or go out for dinner, and I love it when I can go to a place that I already know that I'm already familiar with. I can socialize with a ton of people at one time if I'm in a familiar spot. And if I am going to a new spot, I always do my research. I look up the menu and pick what I'm going to eat beforehand. I look at photos on, you know, Google Maps of exactly what it looks like outside and inside. I look up how busy it's going to be at the time that I go. So I can walk in armed with as much information as possible. That way, when the outliers occur, I'm not, my head's not already reeling. I can handle it better. Mm -hmm. I think like the, the other sort of side, side to it, you know, side to the familiar environment is familiar people as well. But I, I'm not the type of person that would be able to just go out with someone that I don't know. I did do it when I was in first year, as you said, like in the undergrad and stuff in first year. Um, but that was just because I didn't know anybody. <laughs> and if if I'm going to someone new, if I'm going to someone new or some somewhere that I don't particularly have an interest in, I always need to have a, a, a good friend, like a very close friend to sort of anchor me a little bit or just give me some sort of support or, you know, if, I, if I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed, someone that I can go outside with and just chat with and cool off. I think I think having familiar people around you can sometimes help with new unfamiliar environments. But as you know, you know, vice versa. Like you can I could probably make more friends if I went to Satan's Hollow than if I went to a house rave or uh, with you know some people that I knew. Uh, it's obviously like in in terms of restaurants and and pubs and more sort of tame nights then i'm pretty good with that stuff i i very much like going to places that i know again <laughs> i'll always say you know if my friends were like oh you want to go out and and get a meal somewhere i always say like yep let's go to this exact same place that we've been <laughs> to about 10 times yeah that sounds good and i'll buy the same exact thing and eat it and i'll get the same drink and i'll drink it in the same order that I have every single time I go. Um, and it's going to be perfect. <laughs> it's going to be a perfect time. <laughs> yeah, because it's like, I know I enjoy this, so we're going to do it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I suppose now and again, I do get a bit of a um, instinctual drive to do something new. And although it's not as often as me wanting to stick to my little weird ritual <laughs> <laughs> um it's uh yeah i can still do it it's just i need to sort of plan i need to make sure that i have rest the day before and i'm not talking to too many people the day before and stuff and yes i like to do extroverted things i can really relate to needing to look at your schedule and kind of mapping out how i can emotionally handle these extroverted things so and one example of which is if I go to a convention, I always take off work the next day. So that way I can just have a full day mm -hmm. of recharging. It's just not possible for me to do a convention and go to work the next day. I mean, and I'm, I don't mean that in like a lighthearted sense, like, oh, I'll be so burned out. It'll be so hard. I literally don't think I could function at work. Then like I would not be able to mm -hmm. perform my duties. Um, I think also there's this great tool of – just like looking at your schedule and seeing how many extroverted activities you have in a row and then looking at the following mm -hmm. day and kind of marking that on your calendar as a potential day for a meltdown or a potential day for high levels of overstimulation, just so that way it's on your calendar. Look out for this day. Be prepared this day. I actually learned that from another Asper girl. Um, her name's Alice. She's the Good Bunny Club, but so I want to give her a little bit of credit for that that little tip. But it was a very What's helpful that? Good, tip. To hear. Good Bunny Club. Mm -hmm, the Good Bunny Club. She's Good a, Bunny. Is that the? 
That's her. Instagram stuff. Well, she's an artist. She does have an Instagram, but she does a lot of uh, art that revolves around kind of being this neurodivergent person in a neurotypical world. Hmm. Very interesting. That sounds mm-hmm. good. I would definitely give them a follow as well. And I encourage <laughs> anybody else who's listening to um, <laughs> drop them a cheeky follow too and see what it's about. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I do think that that's a really important thing. And I think it is always good to just, even, even if you don't want to schedule it, schedule it, just have an awareness of when, you know, how much you're doing and, and look, look, sort of look back into your past and realize times that you have sort of had a little bit of a meltdown or you've been so drained that you just can't do anything and try and think of things that led up to that. And it's usually, there usually are things that lead up to that. And that's, for me, it was just both going to work and having social events as well around that and not giving me myself enough time to chill out and relax on my own and do a bit of writing and, you know, just mull about like a lazy boy. Um, it's good. It's, it's healthy. Mm-hmm. And I do think there's kind of this phenomenon. I mean, a lot of aut- autistic people, we, we like to do the same thing over and over again. And so if we get into a rhythm of overextending ourselves and doing extroverted activities over and over and over again, we might, we might try to do that every single day until we burn out. Like you have to almost break it. Sort of a routine. Yeah. So I get you get in routine that you don't know what you're doing and that you're always meeting up with people every day. <laughs> yes. That's happened to me before. <laughs> yeah. It's horrible, isn't it? Cause it's like, <laughs> how do I cope? How do I cope with this? But I can't stop doing it because I feel compelled to because it's part of my routine. So it's, yes. um, I became a, a very large sort of party extroverted outgoing person for about a month or two after, after uni just stayed, <laughs> stayed in Manchester and just, oh yeah, I, I didn't give myself enough break. And when, when I wasn't, when I was doing things that were introverted and sort of on my own, I felt weird because usually mm-hmm. it's, relaxing and it's nice but I was like I don't usually do this I need to I need to go and do something with people and talk to people but it also stresses me out so how am I supposed to do this I don't know (laughs) it's it's not a good place to get yourself into for anybody listening not a good idea (laughs) I'm glad that you share that experience as well um it's it seems like the more that I do these podcasts the more that I realize that you know people do have similar experiences and it's it's nice to hear it's good to hear same to you so th- there there is sort of a um stereotype around autism being the quiet person the trying to avoid social situations all the time the not being able to be social not doing anything that's too out of the way or too extroverted um, why, why is it that we sort of tilt towards this in the eyes of other people, but also just in general? I, I think it has to do with neurotypical people more than it has to do with autistic people, to be honest. I think it has to do with the fact that autistic people don't feel welcome, that um, we've been penalized for social mistakes that we've made. And so when you already have the situation where socializing is draining it's taking out you know the introverted the introverted problem i guess but i don't really think it's too much of a problem but where you're giving of yourself and then the end result of that is to be told that you did it wrong and you get pushed away more yeah why why would a person willingly continue trying to give of themselves just because other people tell them, well, you should do that. You should go out and make friends. You should go out and try new things. When in their experience, it's something that takes away from from feeling good inside and from feeling good outside. So I think that contributes to it a lot. And the more that an autistic person can find a safe space to be themselves in, I think we'd find more autistic people socializing um, whenever 
like for example at conventions there are such they're often very inviting places for the the quirky ones and mm -hmm. i've actually gone to autism panels at conventions which was fabulous very cool <laughs> they were great um, it was just a, an environment where people could share and ask questions and talk about their experiences being autistic. And this, the moderator was excellent because they knew that a lot of autistic people weren't going to just raise their hand and be like, hi, everyone, I have a question. <laughs> so she gave out raffle tickets. Anytime you raise your hand to ask a question, you got a raffle ticket for this anime that was in a lot of people's special interests present. It wasn't actually, I don't really watch anime, but it was, I was just thinking that's very clever. Good job. <laughs> so there'd be a lot of talking and, and it was great. That's awesome. So yeah, I, I do, I do definitely think that there is a little bit of a stereotype and I, I agree like wholeheartedly that if, if we were more integrated and more accepted, accepted at a young age and also you know going through teenagehood which is very important then you know fr from two sides as well from one because we do a lot of work to try and fit in whereas neurotypical people don't do a lot of work to help us fit in no no I don't think it's in in a case most cases I don't think it's out of spy i just don't think that they understand and they have they're a bit not not willfully ignorant i think to to some extent a lot of the problems that we have socially are revolve revolve around our experience at school around neurotypical people and it, it can be really heartbreaking and soul destroying and it can lead to a lot of mental health difficulties you know of all the bullying an isolation and alienation and that can that can follow you for the rest of your life and some people don't get out of that and they don't sort of um go through changes because they just feel so disheartened and they have such negative experiences around people that they just they find it really difficult and i do i do think in general that there is some neurological biological influence that makes us a little bit more closed off but i think if more was done about that at a young age it, it wouldn't be as much of a carrying on thing we wouldn't be so in our heads and introverted when we're older i i think that there are definitely like factors from both sides but i think if if we were to tackle the social issue at hand it would make a lot of difference or at least it just give people the option to socialize if they want to, which is the most important thing, I think. Yeah. Having just having the opportunity to be yourself and to talk with people, I think is an amazing gift that many neurotypical people might take for granted. Yeah. Um, autistic friends are awesome. Not trying to toot <laughs> my own trumpet. But you know they'll they'll tell you tell you how how it is they'll they'll tell you what they you mean to them in verbal language rather than assumed language or body language or whatever strange ways you guys communicate with. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not really it's not really a good a good standpoint to take. I'm sorry about that, guys. Um, <laughs> but um, I I do think that autistic people make really good friends. They're very from my experience, and it is a bit of a general statement as with anything that we talk about, but yeah, some of the best people that I know are, are autistic and they they just, they, they want the opportunity to go to things, but not necessarily feel obliged to go to things and for people to understand that sometimes they won't go to something because they're too overwhelmed or they're too socially drained and not feel like that's going to impact the other person's opinion of them, make them feel like they're not putting as much into their friendship or something. Op yeah, opportunity. It's a great, it's a great thing. And understanding, having a bit of compassion and empathy can go a long way. Especially if if you're a neuroty neurotypical and you're listening to this, like, what what specific things do you find hard about extroverted things 
have do you have any specific coping mechanisms that you use so a difficult thing for me is to navigate a conversation with multiple people talking at the same time that's very hard especially then too if there is background conversation when there's conversations going on in the background i tend to hear them louder than the conversation in the foreground and then if you add music onto that uh, that's going to trump everything a lot of my friends know me as the person who will suddenly be like, oh, I love this song. And everyone's, they're like, what are you can talking about? Because nobody can hear background. the music, but I... No, we're talking to people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so that's a big one and it will drain me very quickly. So I, I really do just like say, hey guys, I'm going to go to the bathroom or hey i need a break i'll be right back to the toilet <laughs> yeah <laughs> the haven but i i sometimes get sad because sometimes i hear that the bathroom as like a place to go is like a sad thing like i'm hiding in the bathroom but to me i'm like i'm not hiding in the bathroom i am enjoying this bathroom like this is like nice like i just get to be here breathe maybe play a little game on my phone like this is me time and the and then I can go back and try again. But I've become pretty unapologetic about that, about just walking away. Um, and I think, well, there's a whole group of them. Are they really going to be offended because one person walked away for 10 minutes? No, like they can get over it. So that's a big thing that I do when I'm faced with a situation like that. Um, and I think another thing that I have to really work with when I'm in an extroverted activity is paying attention to lighting and i'm not talking mm -hmm. about fluorescent lighting like i'm talking about flashing lights and and things like that so i'm more of a sensory seeker than sensory avoidant although i do have sensory things that i have to avoid in order to be my best self but i love flashing lights a lot and I won't even notice that I'm overstimulated until it's a little bit too late. So when I'm in situations like that, I intentionally stop. I have to tell myself to stop looking at the flashing light, to close my eyes, um, to walk outside for a moment and just take those timed breaks. I think a lot of it does have to do with taking breaks in the end of the day. If I'm going to be extroverted, I'm, I'm not going to be extroverted. If I'm going to do an extroverted activity, I have to honor myself and not deny who I am. And then I'll just have a better time at the end. I think um, in, in terms of like flashing lights, I completely get where you come from. Like I, I find them absolutely captivating. So I went to this event only recently, just last week. Um, I went to see this band called Caravan Palace which is like an electro swing band. Do you know do you know anything about electro swing? I know it's a bit niche. I don't know that phrase, but I bet you if you played the kind of music for me, I'd be like, oh yeah, I didn't know this was called electro swing because I do like a lot of electronic music. A good song to listen to if you want to get into electro swing okay. is Lone Digger. Lone Digger by Caravan Palace. It's a good one. <laughs> okay. Very popular one. Um, I have to check it out. What is the saying? Yeah, flashing lights. Absolutely love them. It's um, I found that I'm I'm more sensory avoidant when it comes to anything sensory that is prolonged. So if it's a very bright light that's staying on, then I can't cope with it. But if it's a bright light that's moving about, a bright light that's flashing on and off, I like it more. And it's it's I found that to be the case in a lot of a lot of things so short bursts of interaction short bursts of touch any anything like that anything that is sensory I, I like strong bursts of something and then nothing rather than constant medium or low level amount of sensory stimulation i i don't know why i i think i i very much like being overstimulated but i don't want to be overstimulated all the time if you know what i mean yeah definitely do you have like uh, anything that you use at home like in terms of like lights or anything or sensory things that you use just to get that that sensory seeking stuff i definitely like to play loud music 
to give me like that burst. Um, I stem dance a lot. So just like put on a song or two and just bam, go at it. And then I'm like, okay, that was good. Yeah. Just sit down. You would love electro swing then. (laughs) (laughs) So very much a dancey type of music. So yeah, coping mechanisms. I think the main thing for me, as as is for you, taking breaks, giving yourself a break, recognizing that you need to, you know, you need some time alone just to just to recharge when you're doing something like that. Because the the more intense it is, and the more active it is, the harder it is um, on your your brain and on your mental capacity, and it, you don't want to let it tip over. I think and. Yeah, toilet. It's always a safe haven for autistics from my experience. <laughs> I've I've gathered that every you know, every single person that's come onto my podcast has always said that they cope with things by finding a bathroom. It's it's just like it's nice, isn't it? It's just like a little cozy place and um <laughs> you can lock yourself in and it's it's very small and you can put your headphones on and nobody know that you've got your headphones on and you can just kind of sit there and chill out and not have any social engagement. It's very nice for me, best place to go in any sort of social occasion. Maybe not clubs, like some clubs, because some of those are a bit, yeah. are a bit mank. Yeah, not mm-hmm. great. But then if that's not available outside somewhere in a corner, usually a good spot. So what are the benefits of being more extroverted? Because I know we're we're talking a lot about how to do it and how to cope with it, but why do we need to do it? Or why why should we try to do at least some? I think it's good to have connections with other people and not to feel isolated all the time. So I think being extroverted gives us human connection that many, many people crave. I think also it gives us opportunity to enjoy the things that we like in new ways and to just enrich our life experiences. Maybe that sounds like a lot, but I think that going out and trying something new that's related to something that we love just expands our love for the things that we have. So I think connection and enrichment are some of the greatest things about being extroverted or doing extroverted things. I think networking mm-hmm. is also really important. It can get you far and you can get job opportunities, um, do better at your job by making those connections and also learn new things by meeting new people. So there are, there are so many benefits to engaging with others we just have to set ourselves up for success in order to get those benefits. Hmm. And I think, um, you know, for, for a lot of autistic people, I think we, we do in general try to do these things, but I think for, for some people it can be extremely daunting and some people just really don't know where to start. Like how, how do you start doing that? It's like, you, you can't just show up at an event and not know anyone because you won't be able to cope with it because it's unfamiliar and there's unfamiliar people. And some people just can't get over that. And it's too anxiety provoking. How, how do you get around that? So definitely I, I trust my best friend and I love to try new things with her because she really helps me walk through those initial, extremely awkward moments of starting an extroverted activity My first convention I went to, I went with her. And for the first hour, we honestly just walked to each place on the map of the convention, or I just sat and stared for an hour. (laughs) And she sat with me. If I had been alone, I would have been terrified. But because she was there, I knew that if something went wrong, it would be okay in the end. So I I think having that safe person, yeah so helpful i think yeah have having having sort of like a person as as an anchor or a person to be around you so that you don't feel um 
isolated or, or or weird or paranoid is quite is quite good it's quite a good thing to have um i think also a, a good thing to sort of stress an, an important thing is that events like social events no matter where you start from are always going to be somewhat stressful and you have to it's the the process of doing those things is is less about oh it's going to feel easier it's more about oh i know exactly how it's going to feel and i know exactly what i have to do um for me like the first hour of doing anything uh particularly largely um extroverted is always very anxiety provoking and and hard especially if i've been on my own or i've been in a very solid not introverted routine for a long time and it is it is difficult and i, I have done a lot of social things i've I, i've been traveling for like two months i've been with with my mate constantly for about two months which although he's a really really good friend it it can be draining being around someone all the time but it is it's still something that you can do it's not something that i don't recommend doing that like just to start off but <laughs> it is something to, to have in mind that even if you know we're talking about certain things that we've done and going out and stuff it doesn't mean that we're different and we find it easier it's just that we've we know what to expect a little bit more and we know how to deal with it would you say that like that was that would be the case like what is your initial um you know if you're just having a bit of a introverted week or two weeks or a month or all that and then jumping into something a bit more extroverted how do you feel i i tend to tell myself this will be hard because it's the first time but after mm-hmm. this first time i will now feel comfortable going to that restaurant again or i'll feel comfortable going to that coffee shop again or that convention again or that music venue again the first time it's so hard cuz everything's new but then i can become a master of that new thing and it becomes familiar so, mm-hmm. so i think that's comforting for me mhm i i also want to say that if someone doesn't have a close friend that they can bring to these new experiences bringing something that gives an anchor of some kind can be so helpful so taking your dog people love to go up and pet dogs you know so that helps and that can be a starting point a conversation point taking a camera to take photos that gives you an anchor a purpose to be in that new place um or like i keep saying convention 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 but cosplaying it helps you mm-hmm. to meet other people who are interested in that same fandom that you're cosplaying from so bringing an anchor of some kind a conversation starter of some kind can take off some of that pressure of how do i even start talking yeah and i think i think if um people want to to do those sort of extreme extrovert things it is important to build up some friendships or with other people first i think one one of the things that i've i've touched on in one one of my videos is going somewhere that you you know like a framework to i think i think, I think we talked about this as well but um having having a bit of a framework and knowing what you, you should talk about is it's unimaginably helpful like if you hate small talk which i know a lot of us do um and if you mm-hmm. struggle to think of new topics go to somewhere where you know people are going to like the same thing as you do so you can just monologue away and you can um obviously like have a conversation not just speak at them but at least you know sort of an idea of what you're supposed to be talking about or something that you can talk about cuz the worst thing worst thing is is going somewhere that you have nothing in common with anybody because you've just decided oh, i'm going to go to like a house party like just off the bat <laughs> I've, got no, I've got no friends that i'm just going to go to a house party that's a great wow. way no no way you're going to have a mixed bag of people with different ideas and values and personalities it's not a good way to navigate yourself but i'm not saying that you would do but if you were thinking about it don't do it 
it's not a good idea before. <laughs> <laughs> cool so i think that's pretty much all that i wanted to talk about in terms of like questions so we uh should we go over some of like the main things that you want people to take away like what what things that immediately um or gradually pop into your head that you want people to understand from this podcast i would say that i hope that autistic people can feel empowered to do extroverted activities but at the same time don't try to do extroverted activities because you feel like other people are telling you to do them like i think it's important for us to seek out the extroverted activities that genuinely interest us and move forward from there i think that's the biggest takeaway like don't just do it because i want to make friends you know but go to the things that have actual meaning and then we can grow from there. And I'd say the other big thing is, is that mindset of trying something new is only leading to having something else be familiar. That the first time is the hardest time. And from then on, you now have a new thing that you can like go to every time and order the same thing and bring people (laughs) to. And I think that those are the main takeaways that I hope autistic people can, can enjoy hearing about, can, can, can move forward with. That's great. Like you, you've been, I think you've been the quickest person to bring up things to mind. Have you made a list? Have you made a little like note on uh, what you wanted to say? Or is it just off the top of your head? Just, just that verbal Social processing. Skills on point. <laughs> Social skills on point. Very good. Um, so yeah, last question, which is something that I ask every single person that comes onto this podcast. What does autism mean to you? Autism to me, two things to me. It is the answer and autism is also my liberator. So autism spectrum disorder for me was the answer to all of those lies that I told myself about being broken or being undeserving. It was the answer that told me that's not true. It's not just you. There's all these other people like you and all of you, all of us, we have so much to offer and to share. And I think that leads into autism being my liberator. Every time that I feel scared or feel uncomfortable. I have this beautiful thing that just tells me you're autistic and it's okay. And it's going to make things different. Sometimes it's going to make things hard. Sometimes it's going to make things beautiful. And I choose to always think of autism as a positive thing in my life that leads me forward to being the best version of myself instead of denying who I am. Wow. I don't have any other words to say about that. That was amazing. You touched, you definitely touched the nerve with that. (laughs) Um, I haven't received an answer like that before. And honestly, like every time I ask this, I have no idea what's gonna, gonna happen. Uh, Some people give, you know, sort of very logical answers and factual answers, but that, that was That sounded very personal. Thank you for that. Okay. So that pretty much does it for the the questions. Are there any links or social media things that you want to give out uh, just in case anybody wants to follow up and, and see what you do and follow you and all that? I would always say, please check me out on my Instagram, Aspinel. I love receiving direct messages. If you ever just want to drop a line or ask for a tip, please feel free to. I always screenshot them and get to them eventually in my posts. And I just hope to meet other autistic people through Instagram. It's just been, I'm so grateful for my community there. So come join it. Definitely. And I will put those links down in the description along with anything else that you think of that you want to add later guys thank you so much for listening to us talk about our special interest autism 
Hooray! <laughs> um, <laughs> it's been really great to talk to you, and it's um, it's definitely been a little bit different than than the usual podcasts that I do. So it's nice to have a bit of um, bit of difference in it, you know. Some variety. <laughs> Some variety. Yeah, I was trying to think of the word. Uh, but yeah, uh, this has been the Forty Oti Podcast. My name is Thomas Henley. I don't know if I said that at the start. I usually open with that. But yeah, um, I have a YouTube channel and stuff called Asperger's Growth. And you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all of those lovely social media sites at at Asperger's Duck. As- no, <laughs> I was going to do my email again. <laughs> no way. Ah, oh, God. <laughs> right. At Asperger's Growth. That's my social medias. And if you want to find more out, more things about the uh, 40 Oti podcast, more ways of viewing it, it's available on Spotify. I believe it's available on Apple Podcasts now, now that I've changed some things around with the titles. And it's always available on YouTube as well. Listen to it on the, um, the podcasting services because it helps me a lot. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> If if you have any ideas of what you want the podcast next podcast to be on, uh, or you just want to send something in for me to read out on the podcast, let maybe a little question that I can add on to the end. The email is aspergersgrowth at gmail dot com. Did it? Okay, Brill. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on, Lauren. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And um, I hope that we can do some more work together in the future. Looking forward to it. Have you enjoyed your 40 or experience? Oh, yes. This has been really enjoyable. I feel like I have so many thoughts and more questions just teeming in my mind. And I just love being able to sit and talk about autism. Like, who doesn't love that? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, everybody, I'm going to bid you a farewell. Again, thank you so much for listening to me and Lauren ramble about autism in a very cool way, just saying. And I'll hope, hopefully see you guys in another episode, fumbling over my words. Lauren, say your goodbyes. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> see you later. Stay strong. Keep being strange and weird because it's cool. And I'll see you in the next podcast. Bye.